This is the Wally and Mathot Show, powered by Barhaven Ford. Now here are your hosts, Brent Wallace and Mark Mathot. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the show. I'm Brent Wallace. He's Mark Mathot. And we're just about done round two of the NHL draft map. It was yeah. seven hours long. <laughs> That's too, way too long. I mean, what do you do? It's, uh, it's just the way it's going this year. But I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of the way it's been kind of organized oh. and set up. It's, it's tough. Like, I remember covering the draft and uh, round one, great. Get through it, all done. Yep. Go back for round two. You just want to scratch your eyeballs out because it's just, it's long, it's drawn out. Now, congrats to everybody who got drafted. And for them, it's a really special day. But when you're covering it and you're still covering it at the end of the draft, when you've got to talk to everybody, it yeah. is really long. That is, yeah. they've got to do something to try and figure this out. Seven well, especially, hours. Yeah, those round and, and and as you mentioned, Wally, all those later rounds, like you don't really know who a lot of those players are. Like, no, no offense to them. I've been a part of that group, so I can say it. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. I'm not going to beat down on it too much, but yeah, I agree yeah. with you. It's way too, way too long, way too long. It is. Now, speaking of uh, great draft shows, actually no one was speaking of our great draft show, but thank you to everybody who tuned in to watch the other night. Uh, we had a ton of fun. So we'll look to probably try and do that again next year. Um, this is the Wally Mathot Show powered by Barhaven Ford. Don't forget to check out their newly Roush inspired lineup of BFC custom vehicles at barhavenford.com. Of course, you can go in to see them at 555 dealership drive. In Barhaven. Coming up later in the show, we are going to announce the winner of the four tickets to opening night, the Sens home opener against Toronto. Uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, free agency opens up on Wednesday. So we've got TSN Insider and good friend Darren Dreger stopping by for a chat brought to you by Whitewater Beer. Of course, reminder, uh, nothing goes down as good as a Whitewater beer on those long summer nights. Uh, Whitewater, use the uh, Mythot and Wally coupon code. It's actually the Wally and Mathot coupon code, a 15% off if you go to whitewaterbeer.ca. Uh, and as always, we look uh, forward to the show with Darren Dreger. He's got lots to talk about, and, and he's always got lots of insight. We've traveled the world together, so you'll probably end up having to ask him what it's like to travel with me, and I'm not sure I want the answers. But, <laughs> uh, and I got a great story about how his, his headshot was done on uh, Twitter. He just recently changed it, but his profile pic involves me. Uh, that's all coming up. First, as always, let's get to the headlines brought to you by BEI Bonisher Excavating Inc., helping to shape the Ottawa Valley. Here we go. Femme LaBouche uh, sends surprise everybody by drafting Tyler Boucher, number 10 overall. Uh, sensible selections, assessing the Sens draft. They went off the board a lot, it seems. Uh, taking mm -hmm. a flyer. Seabus welcomes your good buddy, Jacob Voracek, back. We'll take a look <laughs> at how they're starting to rebuild that roster uh, keeping up with the Joneses, Seth Jones joins his brother now in Chicago. Uh, has there been some recent trades that have stood out to you? And Montreal's questionable choice, Logan Mayu drafted in the first round. We'll get to that in just a second. But, Meth, um, Tyler Bush or Tyler Boucher goes 10th overall. He is the son of Brian Boucher. Not many people saw it coming. Are you surprised? And I guess we're seeing a Tom Wilson type player. That's how he's described. If that's the case, I think it's welcome aboard to the Ottawa Senators. Yeah, and that's a compliment. It really is. I mean, you can be a fan, and if you look at it objectively, you have to understand that it's a good thing. Assuming that he can pan out and be an effective player, excuse me, an effective player, even somewhat close to Tom Wilson Wally, for me, uh, that's a welcoming sign coming in because players like that in today's NHL are an absolute nightmare to play against. And it sounds like some of the some of his teammates have spoken up. I saw some of the statements floating around. Um, and on what they believe his game to be. And it sounds like he's going to be a player. So I'm excited. I, again, you can only make assumptions at this point, as you know, we don't really know what these players are capable of. I haven't been watching him just based off all the information out there. It's, it's pretty exciting. So good for them. Uh, sensible selections in at number two, the sense went off and picked another five more players. They went for some size math, but they didn't yeah. necessarily get the guys who were rated right around that number, depending on how you look at it. Now they got six foot three, Zach, Zach Ostopchuk, uh, six foot four, Ben Roger, uh, also six foot five, Chandler Romeo. Do the Ottawa senators need to get bigger? And, and I guess, are we seeing a trend in the NHL that's seeing a bigger lineup like the Philadelphia flyers or the broad street bully days? I thought that that was over with. Well, yes and no. I, <laughs> How do I word this? I, I can I can say to you right now, just based off of the last couple Stanley Cup finals, even the Eastern and Western Conference finals, where you've got the four teams still in the mix, you're seeing some size, particularly on the back end. That's something that really stood out to me. And I know it was a bit of a, a point of contention here over the last two months during the playoffs on social media. We were having these debates with people, but 
Um, as far as the draft goes, I mean, I, I trust everything that Trent Man is doing. And he had a couple of funny little one-liners yesterday yeah. with regards to the uh, the uh, the armchair social media general managers that were very vocal with regards to the picks. And understandably so, everybody's entitled to have a strong opinion. That's what this is all about. But, you know, of course, having said that, if you're the head scout, if you're chief scout, Trent Man, you're allowed to rebuttal and have a, a comment back. And I thought he worded it very, very proper. And it was very, just along the lines, and I'm paraphrasing the, of that, I know the players that I'm selecting. I'm doing all the groundwork and legwork. I, I've, do, I've done all the analysis. I've watched the players. He's very aware of who he's picking. And, and that him and the staff have done a terrific job over the last couple of years. So how do you even argue with it? So when it comes to size, I'm okay with that. I think it's great. we got a lot of skill in that pipeline as we speak, as it stands. So to insulate those players with some big bodies, maybe in two to three, four years from now, that's a good thing. Well, the interesting part is, we all sit around as the armchair quarterbacks and talk about uh, <laughs> how, you know, how could you go off the board and select this guy and that guy? Well, the reality yeah. is in your draft, which, which was a huge deep draft that I think 15 guys played a thousand games, 44% of those players drafted played in the NHL. To, to, yeah. So to say you had to pick around this because this guy is projected to play, you have no idea. So let's revisit it. I don't know, three years, five years, probably five years is better to five understand years, yeah. who they are. Right. But I totally but to, agree. To start rating the draft on this day and go, well, it's a D or an A or a B. You have no idea. <laughs> it's it's but ridiculous. it makes for good debate. And 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 listen, there are some guys out there that do some great work when it comes to uh, you know handing out and, and and coming up with these draft packs, if yep. you will, or whatever you want to call them. But how do you like? You were talking about eighteen-year-old kids. They're not even close to their ceiling. Like they're not even close. And there are so many, there's so many developmental changes between now for these yes. kids and, and, and getting to that next level to the pro level over the next two to three years that like, I, I look, and I mentioned this before when I was following the 2003 draft and a lot of players are getting selected out of me, there are a ton of them that got selected way ahead of me that didn't even get a sniff. Yep. So, you know, to suggest that those things are accurate right now, it's just not true, right? You have to wait and you're going to get a good idea. As you mentioned, Wally, in about five years, You'll, you'll get a much clearer picture of who won these. But again, back to our original point, how do you argue with Trent Mann and the work that they've done so far with drafting? You can't. Can't. So, and the other interesting thing though, is I feel like this is the first time in years I've ever seen or felt like a GM picked or GM, or I guess head scout for that matter, picked based on kind of organizational need and not yeah. going, well, he was the best player available, right? Like they right. always say, we're just taking the best player. Well, it turns out they kept saying we needed some size and we look yeah. to add size. And so interesting that they went kind of off the board that way too, where they yeah. felt like they had enough talent of wherever they needed it. Now they needed some grit. I'm okay with that though, Wally, because yeah. they've got so many young players, like good young players right now that are coming in. I mean, to me, and I'm, I'm repeating myself a little bit, but I just don't see why I would have an, or I don't see why anybody would have an issue with the way they've selected this time around. Cause like I said earlier, right now, you're looking for foot soldiers to kind of fill out the rest of that lineup over the next five years from now. Anything yeah. can happen. Your seventh rounder might be a stud. You just don't know. But more importantly, these guys are the ones that are doing all the legwork going from building to building across the country in the United States and Canada and viewing these players. And they do a hell of a job at it. So we just have to trust yeah. them, trust the process, wait five years from now and see how it works out. Uh, quickly. Uh, Tyler Boucher said that Brady Kachuk reached out to him right away. It was the first guy to text him. I know it was a different era kind of when you got drafted. Did anybody from Columbus as a player reach out to you early on? No, nobody. Okay, the only guys that reached out to me were Kyle Quincy and Danny Savret. And they were two players that I was playing with also in that draft, uh, my age that I played with in London. But as far as players from Columbus, are you kidding me? Do you think Rick Nash gave two shits about a, a six round draft pick out of London, Ontario? Probably not. So all jokes aside, I wasn't yeah. expecting too many phone calls, so it's all good. But no, it just shows how differently the like yeah. the world is, right? Everybody, oh, yeah. Like, like I just looked at Tyler Boucher all of a sudden, like Drake Batherson and Sokolov, and everybody else is following on Instagram suddenly, and Austin yeah. Watson. Like that's just how quickly things have changed and evolved. So I was just curious of when that kind of started to change. And I, yeah. I, and I guess it's probably in the last six, seven years at most. Yeah, well, there's right? no, we didn't have cell phones, right? Like I didn't have yeah. a cell phone in junior and, and there was certainly no social media other than maybe MSN Messenger, maybe. So unless <laughs> See, Rick Nash had MSN Messenger, there was no way I was getting hold of anybody in Columbus. 
see Rick Nash at the payphone. What's that? 613. <laughs> anyway. Calling my billets landline. But no, yeah, it's all good. No hard feelings. Uh, speaking of Columbus, on to number three, and that's taking a flyer. So Columbus yeah. brings back Jacob Vorchek, who they drafted originally overall. Uh, I know you know him. I, I guess explain to me the type of player that Jake Vorchek is that you know. Yeah, and I know him really well. He's a beauty. Um, I the, the one story I can remember regarding Jake uh, that sticks out, I mean, there's a lot. First of all, he loves music, loves singing oldies. He's one of those guys that comes over from the Czech Republic and just kind of completely immersed himself into, you know, American culture and music and movies, and he's big into that. And the one road trip we had, we were all packed up. It was a day trip. You fly into Nashville the day before. You, you know, you get there, you settle into the hotel, you leave the next day after the game. All Jake packed, was this dirty old toothbrush that looked like a dog toothbrush, like something that I'd brush my dog's teeth with. And he had it on the inside of his suit jacket and he walks on the plane with absolutely nothing else. No extra underwear, no socks, no clothing. That was Jake. Obviously he's he's matured a lot since then, but he was just always such a funny guy. But, but as far as his play goes and jokes aside, of course, really good at protecting the puck. He's heavy. Um, you know, doesn't look like a bodybuilder by any means, but he's got these truck of legs, kind of like Sidney Crosby on the ice where he's very strong on his skates and uh, very hard to knock off the puck. Good setup guy. I know his numbers kind of decreased the last year, but that was, you know, different circumstances, obviously with COVID and a weird year, but I still think he can be a very effective player. So uh, where does he fit in Columbus right now? Maybe hopefully can prime up line a, a little bit and feed him some pucks and, and set him up. But other than that, uh, it was an interesting hockey trade, one for one. Uh, th those two, I believe, played together in Columbus as well. Yeah. So it's kind of weird, but uh, he's going back. And, and I know the fans were were big fans of his, uh, if you will, and 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 uh, he's well liked in that city. And I know Columbus takes on millions of extra dollars in cap space and salary uh, acquiring Jake Vorchek. And so, yeah. Then uh, people are now saying that he's going to be perhaps the setup man for Patrick Line to get him going. Do you see yeah. Vorchek as that type of player? Yeah, I do. But I mean, the whole line A thing to me is, in, is intriguing because I've had this discussion with people and it can get heated. I just, he, it looks like he's carrying a piano on his back sometimes when he's going up and down the ice. And I don't know if that's just his, I, and again, I haven't watched him enough. I mean, I played against him enough, but I know he's, a, he's got an incredible shot and that's his bread and butter, but his skating to me has always been a bit of an issue. And obviously his motivation to play good defense has always been an issue as we have seen with his fights with torts back there. So, or maybe not <laughs> fights, but the, the little bit of animosity and the benchings that have happened. So this might propel him forward a little bit. Jake is that guy that can pass the puck. He's a really good disher. If, if there's anybody around the NHL, he's one of them really. So if this is an attempt to perhaps kind of invigorate Patrick Line, I'm all for it. We'll have to wait and see. I think torts calls those discussions. So. Yeah, discussions. You're right. I stand corrected. They're discussions. <laughs> okay, so I, Columbus may be the biggest mover, I think, over the last, I don't know, since, okay, since January 23rd. Nick Foligno, Cam Atkinson, Seth Jones, David Savard, uh, Pierre-Luc Dubois, and even Tortorella, all gone from the organization. It's like That's a huge shakeup that they're going through right now in Columbus. Well, the, yeah, and the biggest ones were Anderson and Pierre-Luc Dubois. Like, for me, those were two guys that I couldn't imagine wanting to move, right? Like, they're big guys that are le legitimate, like Cam Neely style power forwards that can both fight, both very hard to play against, and they have a good scoring touch. So it's still mind boggling to me. And again, I know there were many reasons, but um, you know, they kind of blew up the line, the, the lineup a little bit. And so here we are back at square one, where are they rebuilding? What are they doing? You lose Seth Jones. I'm a huge fan of Seth Jones. Some people bring out the fancy stats and graphs and show that he's declining. His numbers were declining a little, but I think that's also representative of where the team was at. Mm. And I, I, I mean, his new contract is proof that there's obviously clearly still a lot of interest for Seth Jones, but that's another topic. But as far as the team goes, yeah, I, it's intriguing to me, Wally. I feel bad for the fans because that fan base has stood by that team through thick and thin, despite the ups and downs. They're always there. We've seen them when they're in the playoffs. They're known to just stand on their feet for periods on end where they don't sit down. They're all up into the games. They do play second fiddle a little bit to the Ohio State Buckeyes, the sure. football team, of course. And that could be a bit of an issue maybe for some younger players that want a little more notoriety maybe. I know it makes you sound like a baby a little bit, but that's just part of pro sports, right? And maybe some guys like to be coddled a little more. And 
Um, but other than that, I mean, the facility is unreal. They've got a practice rink attached to the building, which is incredible if you're a player. And the downtown area is beautiful. It's nice. It's clean. There's lots of great bars and restaurants. So it's interesting. I, I can't figure out why the team is sort of disbanding with all these guys, but there's an opportunity now to rebuild. I, I know what it is. They want out because of that stupid cannon. Okay. <laughs> no, that's you know what? exactly what the cannon, the cannon sucks. No, the cannon. Sorry. I shouldn't say that. The <laughs> cannon does not suck. It's historic, but it's the Bush. I, I think they're still playing that machine head song when the guys come out on the ice, my last year playing there. And I'm forgive me if I've already told the story that song, I, I was pleading with people there to change it. I'm like, guys, come on. Like whoever's up top, like let's change this up a little bit. Cause I can't keep listening to machine head. That Bush song was driving me crazy. So now I've got like a form of PTSD Wally when I'm driving in the car and I hear that thing come on, I turn it off immediately. So <laughs> they do need to change a couple of things, but for the most part, uh, fantastic organization. It's very well run for the most part, really good staff. there working for the players. I can't figure it out. Okay. So did you ever get comfortable with the cannon? Yeah, oh yeah, you forget about it eventually, right? I, and, it, and it's every it's time fun, I go in there. Yes, but when you're the guy scoring the goals, which obviously was not me very often, but whenever you were on the ice for a goal and you're playing in that te- in that building, it's fun, it's loud, and the fans love it. So what the heck? And it's symbolic, right? It's the Blue yeah. Jacket symbol, yeah. or it's a, it's symbolic to Blue Jackets in the Civil War area. So for me, I'm all for it. I hate the cannon. Um, okay. <laughs> so you brought up Seth Jones. Number four is keeping up with the Joneses. So yeah. the Edmonton Oilers trade uh, his brother to Chicago. And now all of a sudden Seth Jones ends up in Chicago. Uh, is, is there, is that the trade that stands out to you the most of recently, or there's like Sam Reinhardt off to Florida. Uh, there's yeah. obviously Oliver Ekman Larson and calling Connor Garland to Vancouver, Ryan Ellis. And of course, Cam Atkinson to Philadelphia. Is there anything that really stands out? Well, the Garland move was good because I just I got a chance to watch a lot of him when he was playing overseas, yeah. right? Uh, and I thought he's a fantastic player. But as far as surprises go, yeah, the Seth Jones one to me, surprised, not totally, but I think I'm just happy for him. I think, you know, he very clearly wanted out. He's got a chance now to play with his brother and uh, he signed a brand new deal. And, and I think more importantly for me is I'm just excited to watch him play in a new city. And I know what he's capable of. I do believe he's a top 10 defenseman in the NHL. That might be a bold thing to say here, but when he's on his game with his size and his ability to skate and move the puck, not a lot of guys that can match him. And, and I mean, he's a, he's a, he's, he's an Olympian. He will play for team USA in the Olympics. He's a legitimate player. So I'm excited to see what he's able to do this year on a new team. And hopefully he can find some, some jam again and start putting up some more points because he's capable of doing it. He is elite. I, and I guess with Ryan Ellis also moving, it just reminds me of like Nashville who had Shea Weber, Ryan yeah. Ellis. Uh, like yeah, but I'm not. Roman Yossi, Seth Jones. They had so much talent on that blue line. They were just never I'm not sold on Ryan game. Ellis. I, I'm sorry. I, he's this little guy who has this <laughs> big beard. You cut that little beard off and he looks like a little lawn gnome. Okay. So I, I just. I think he's a little bit, again, and I guess I shouldn't say no disrespect to him because I'm already <laughs> disrespecting him, but yeah, I, I just, I don't see it with him. I don't get the hype. I, I think he's very small. He's not very physical. I don't think he defends all that well, but he can move the puck pretty good. He's, he's very composed with it and he's pretty good around the blue line and on the power play. So I'll give him that. But um, he's one of those guys that just, I didn't, I wanted to jump him a lot, you know, like when I was playing out there, because he'd be hacking and whacking some of your skilled guys. And and it really rubbed me the wrong way, but I guess that's on me. I never did anything about it. So number five, Montreal's questionable choice. Okay. This is a touchy subject. Logan Mayu, who said, I don't want to be drafted this year. I respect that. I need to help better myself. And I basically take a year off. And then all of a sudden Mm -hmm. Montreal comes in and goes, yeah, forget all that. Logan, we're going to pick you in the first round. This is, and while we can discuss Logan Mayu and all that stuff, th- this particular thing I want to bring up is Montreal and what are they doing? I don't understand yeah. when you clearly can see what's going on and what's transpiring to then go, we're going to take him in the first round. This is what, sh- this is, I guess they talk about hockey culture. This is sports culture. And that is, I don't really care so much about that. I want to win hockey games and this is what we're going to do. And this guy is going to help us win hockey games. Oh yeah, this is tough. Um, you know, and he plays, there's coming from the London Knights and, um, I've actually, I was actually following him, believe it or not, leading up to this and, um, before everything went down and, 
um, you know, just a dumb move, obviously. You, just, uh, you, you know, and when you say dumb move, you're just talking about Logan. I'm, talking, decision, about Lo right? I'm yeah. talking. I'm talking about what Logan did, and yeah. and and I feel I feel for the victim. I mean, that's it's awful. I mean, and I've got a daughter, yeah. you know, and so uh, it's hard to separate yourself from that. But um, you know, he's 18. He's a little younger. And do I want to crucify him right now online? Like most people are doing? No, I just feel for everybody. It's a very unfortunate thing. Should Montreal have just respected the fact that he wanted to opt out of the draft? Probably, I guess. Um, because what, what, what do we expect here? Right? Like we knew right away the moment he was picked. I mean, I knew right away, just, just hearing the name thinking, Oh boy, this yeah. is going to get heated. Right. It, and, and, and it did. And people were pissed off and, um, you know, I, I just, I just, it's a different world now, eh? And, and these kids have cell phones and social media and I'm, I don't know how I feel about all that stuff and I'm not veering off topic. I'll get right back to it. But, you know, I think about my kids and social media and what it does to the kids right now in high school. And it's stuff that you, me and Craig never had to deal with growing up. Right. So you send out a picture of somebody like that. Like, first of all, what's compelling you to pull out your phone or take a picture or whatever it is. And then second, it's like, once that happens, it's out there. You're not, you can't undo it, right? So it was, it was an idiotic move. And as far as Montreal goes, I mean, yeah, I don't I don't really understand what like from a forget from a from an ethics standpoint, but like even a PR point of view, like what are you like, what do you expect from this? I mean, I know they tried to get ahead of it, but I don't know what to say right now, Wally. It's an uncomfortable topic that obviously needs to get talked about. It's a learning experience. You know damn well. He's never going to do anything like that again. Now, is that because he got caught or does he feel, does he genuinely feel bad? More answers that I can't, I don't know. And I don't want to sit here and presume what he's thinking or feeling because that's also unfair. And I certainly don't want to bully him for doing, for, for him doing what he did because now I'm a bully. So yeah. it's a very tough topic to kind of navigate through. All I can think about is the victim in this case and how, he, how she is feeling. And I'm hoping that she's okay. And that, you know, she's felt a heartfelt apology from Logan and that, that eventually we can move on and hopefully he gets a little help and he learns from this. I, I don't know what else to say. Okay, so there's a couple of points. One, I'll say when you said, you know, I don't know what compels you to bring out your phone. Well, that's an ego thing, right? That's a typical bravado guy thing that I'm untouchable yeah. and I'm better. So well, that's yeah. part of the problem, right? That's what 18. needs to be addressed. Yeah. Yeah. I understand, but that yeah. needs to be addressed. Not every 18 year old does it. He needs oh, to no, no, no. Right? I understand be, that. be taught I... that this is completely unacceptable. So yeah, yeah, for sure. that part we both agree on. The other thing yes. is though, uh, for Montreal to do this, they've now thrown him right back into the fire. So if, and if every, and I, and I keep hearing that other teams were going to select them. So this is all on the NHL. This is an NHL thing. He yeah. should have just gone back into the draft next year. If he had had a year off where he learned or perhaps he was just he was going to better educate himself and yeah. it would not have put the pressure, I guess, back on him as much. Right. So there's no right. repercussions for him. He goes from having this despicable action to happen, a victim yeah. out there that just wants an apology where she says he has not officially really apologized. He's sent right. some text messages to now throwing him in the middle of this where, hey, you're a first round pick. Congrats. You're going to make. $925,000 yeah. a year. That stuff is what stings. And so should I think he should be banned for the rest of his life? I, no, that's pretty tough. But no. I will say they a year off would not have caused yeah. any but then, issue. And then so where do we draw? You know, we, we had, had a bit of a discussion on this yeah. earlier. Like, where do we draw the line then? So are we deciding that we're all collectively going to move on in a couple of years? Or are we just going to hold it against him forever? Or I do agree with you right now. Like, he should be in hiding. And I, I don't know that his name being out there at all, let alone being drafted is ideal. And you talk about repercussions because I'm trying to look at it objectively here. Yeah. And we look at it like repercussions. Well, his name's been literally dragged through the mud now. Is that enough? No, probably not. But I'm just saying, I can't imagine what he's going through. But yeah. more importantly, as I said earlier, I can't imagine what she's going through because all this stuff is being uncovered again. Yes, exactly. On a grander so she's scale. Relive it. Yeah. And now she's reliving it over and over again, every freaking time someone brings yeah. it up. So you're right. It all goes back to the original point. He wanted to opt, he wanted to opt out. 
that probably would have been the best for all parties involved exactly. because now she can live with a little more peace and quiet and doesn't have to hear about it. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. And we're back at square one. So again, I don't even know how to answer this because it's just I, such a, it's such an unfortunate circumstance, you know? I, yeah, yeah. I'm just not even sure the risk is worth it. Like, are you telling me there's no other players in the draft that could help you win? It was Logan Mayu or nobody else. Like I don't that's know. The, yeah, I don't, right. I don't. That's what it says. So yeah. I just wish Montreal would have thought this through a little bit better. And of course we can go through and go back to, I guess, Mark Bergevin being with Chicago and all the stuff that's going on in Chicago. I, I just, I, this whole Montreal thing bothers me. They had the press release ready. They, this yeah. was all premeditated. If you yeah, will. Yeah, that was, yeah. The right? press like release that's, was obviously That's the written. stuff. <laughs> It just goes to show like people keep talking about hockey culture and how it needs to change. Well, this yeah. is exactly the stuff that people And you know what? Change. You want to talk hockey culture. And I experienced a little bit of that, like shades of it, if anything, in junior and, and not just junior hockey, OHL. And it's not, and that's not an indictment towards any team in particular. It was very prevalent um, in junior hockey, you know, junior B, wherever you're playing, where you just kind of have a bit of that culture, eh? Like as far as, you know, some guys having a certain opinion on other people or, you know, relationship stuff that's very much broadcast or throughout the team or guys that have encounters with women. Those are all things that I think stem from junior hockey. And it seems to be a thing where, and again, I'm not going to make any presumptions because I've been out of that area for a long time now. It's been 20 years, yeah. but uh, I feel like that's an area that needs to be addressed right there. It's almost oh. like you got to nip it in the bud there. And then it, because at the NHL level, it's much different. You know, it's much more professional. Everyone's got families. It's a different dynamic, but it's the junior hockey stigma yep. thing that needs to change. And we've seen that not just with this stuff, but with hazing and all well, that kind of bring crap. Up hazing. Yeah. yeah. Hazing to me, like that was something that I've been through. I, I, you know, we had to, we had to, you know, tell a joke in junior A. And if the joke wasn't funny on the bus, on the way to the game, we all just sit in the fucking bathroom. I'm swearing. We all just sit in the bathroom almost naked like crunched up like five or six players in a bathroom, like garbage like that. And I won't even tell you what the rookie party looked like. So, yeah. you know, you, you experience something like that and you're looking up to, you know, 18, 19, 20 year olds that are telling you what to do and you're 16 and you're very impressionable at that age. It can, it can be very difficult. And you certainly want to try to conform to the group, like anything at that age, you know, you're, you want to fit in. And so yeah. it's an issue that needs to be addressed. And I think one of the major ways you can address it is by getting ex players and NHL guys and players that are looked up to at the next level down to those levels and talk to them and say, Hey, this is bullshit. This is nonsense. What are we doing here? Stop doing that. Like, and have these meetings before the season so that it makes it more comfortable, more comfortable for all the young kids coming up. And then that doesn't carry on into the next generation of players. Right. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. No. And thankfully they've now brought in penalties for hazing. Right. And so they're severe. So finally, yeah. they're starting to move towards that. But you're right. Junior hockey has a lot of issues it needs to clean up when it comes to hockey culture. I, I completely yeah. agree with you. I, in fact, and I don't mean to keep going on. There was, I remember one no, player. It's good. And we, were, and we were kind of, I'll say, buddies or whatever. He played on the Ottawa Senators. And we, we were out doing a charity function. And I watched him deal with servers. And uh, we talked a bit after. And he's like, I've never gone on a date with a girl. One is I always played Friday nights. And we always, never went to a high school dance or anything. He goes, I just know how to go out with girls, but not go on dates, if you know what I mean. And so that was the yeah. thing, right? They just, they, they don't understand how to properly respect people and respect, I guess, females. And that's what needs to change. Yeah. So and, and, and this, and I don't want to paint a brush over every player. Cause I'm going to tell you guys right now, the vast majority of hockey players that I played with are awesome guys that are incredibly respectful yeah. It's the odd ones, right? It's the odd apple that just kind of paints a bad, a negative picture for the rest of us. And it's like that in any walk of life in any other line of work, but particularly, obviously in sports, it's a little different because you come into money at a young age, but yeah, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough scenario. And it's, it's very much something that still needs to be addressed. And I'm usually pretty partial with this thing. Like I like to look at both sides, but in this case, it, it is absolutely an issue that needs to be fixed. And coming up uh, later, we will talk to Darren Dreger about the Logan Mayu issue and what his thoughts are on that. Um, those are the yeah. headlines for now. And again, that topic needs to probably be continued throughout because I don't, you know, we need to try and change that hockey culture. I don't want to sound preachy, but eventually no, no. we've got right. to get better at treating everybody with a level of respect here. Absolutely. Um, so those are the headlines built by BEI, Bonisher Excavating Inc., helping to shape the Ottawa Valley. Coming up, as I said, we've got Darren Dreger is going to join us 
Uh, in the chat, quenched by whitewaterbeer.ca, remind nothing, nothing is quenching as well as a uh, long summer night taking a whitewater beer and pounding a couple of those back as meth likes to do occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> Whitewaterbeer.ca, uh, of course, use the Wally Mathot 15% off coupon code. Uh, the Wally Mathot Show powered by Barhaven Ford will be right back after this. Welcome back to the show and welcome now into the Whitewater Chat is our good friend TSN's hockey number one insider, uh, host of the Ray and Dregs and proprietor of the world-renowned Dregger Cafe uh, <laughs> and and uh, my twin apparently because we should have probably asked each other about what they were wearing today. Uh, Darren Dregger, welcome to the show. Hey Wally, uh, good to be here. <laughs> I, you know what? So you're right, uh, you know, host of the Ray and Dregs podcast and I don't know what you guys are like, we're actually preparing for a summer hiatus, right? So um, as we're doing this here on Monday, uh, uh, you know, I'm looking through my closet and I'm like, okay, I got to tape like three podcast interviews here. We're putting some stuff in the can and I'm like, ah, I'll just grab that old golf shirt there. That's good enough. We'll be fine. So I don't know what vintage this is. Obviously it's formerly, it's a TSN <laughs> Jersey, right? Otherwise, yeah. or you and I shop at the same place, which isn't very likely. Um, yep. My hair isn't quite as gray as yours, but yeah, we're, we're getting close to twin status here. It is. It's pretty good. I, uh, I still have like 20 golf shirts. I don't know yeah. what to do. Like I, so most of the people can't really see the TSN on the sleeve. So I just keep wearing, <laughs> ah, you know what? They're a, they're a big seller at Valu Village. That's where, uh, value village. That's where my old TSN golf shirts go to die. But that's another thing that kind of you know, weirds me out a little bit. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, like how many suits do you have? Like dozens and dozens, yeah. right? Yeah. So every couple of years I'll go through and I'll purge my suit collection. And, you know, there's some great charities that we all try and support obviously. And, you know, with uh, young dudes coming out of university, don't have a lot of money to spend all of that. There's some great yeah. programs out there. I'm fine with that. But when I'm putting a, a bag of T-shirts and golf shirts, stuff that's been worn like dozens of times, and I'm giving it to charity, that's a bit weird to me. Like, who wants my golf shirt that I've worn a hundred times? You'd be surprised, though. I know. Like, I, know. I have buddies that are like, hey, just let me know when you're getting rid of those and give them to me. So <laughs> the one thing is, I, I just before I got let go, I ordered some suits yeah. And I had, for the first time ever, they always put your name on the inside with the jacket, whatever. Yeah. So I had TSN Wally done in it. Well, now I like I can't give them away. I can't do anything with them. I'm such an idiot. <laughs> uh, uh, was it stitched in or was it a label? Yeah. If it was stitched in, you can yeah, actually yeah. pop the stitches. Just uh, get rid of lazy. TSN and put Wally on there. You'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of, there's lots of things we're going to talk to. One is we got to talk a lot of hockey, but before that, uh, you and I have traveled all over the world. It was one of my favorite things to do was the world championships. But I, I just want to bring up, you stood idly by one time when my life was in jeopardy and didn't do, you didn't even flinch to come help uh, me. No. Where was that? Was it Denmark? Slovakia. Slovakia. Okay. Yeah. Um, you just finished I mean, talking to the Hughes brothers for Dregger yeah. Cafe and you're packing up and you're talking to Jim Hughes and then this giant man approaches me and you all just stand there and watch. <laughs> well, I mean, number one, it, 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 something was going to be captured on video, right? It was either going to be really bad for you, <laughs> which would have made for good TV anyway. Um, so, I mean, this was the best of a bad situation. And, and what, <laughs> what you grabbed on video, um, I mean, we've all been entertained by that little snippet countless times. But imagine if it had escalated. Now, if the man had put hands on you, Wally, I probably would have intervened. Uh, and I feel like, who was with us? Parker, Dave Parker, yeah. uh, cameraman extraordinaire. Between the three of us, I, I don't know if we would have been able to handle this dude because <laughs> he, he was, was enormous and had that really out there look too, right? I mean, it wasn't yeah. just that he was a mountain of a human being. It was... There was an, an element of twisted you could see in his eyes that you probably shouldn't mess with. But look, you handled it brilliantly. You didn't know what he was saying at the time, even though now we know essentially what was being said. Um, and it turned out to be a, a, a real good piece of television. So I, I thought I handled it beautifully. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> well, I, next time I go out somewhere, I won't count on you for any security detail. <laughs> That's probably um, safe. 
that same trip, we ended up going to a castle together called Spee's Castle. Uh, I, and I always take my camera and I took some pictures and I ended up taking a picture of you that ended up being your Twitter profile pic. I never got a photo credit. Uh, I don't I don't think that's right. I think I, I must have posted something along the way and, and gave you a photo credit. I mean, you, right. you people don't realize. I mean, obviously, you're very talented, um, but you have many interests and talents. And photography is is obviously one of the many. Uh, I, I was quite impressed by your picture taking abilities. I really was. And I, you know, as we were prepping here for the podcast, um, I told the story of, again, another weird part of my life. I tease my wife, Holly, about this all the time. So her bedside table, she's got a collection of things that are dear to her. Um, both her parents sadly passed on. They were both unbelievable human beings. So there's a picture of mom. There's a picture of dad. I think she's got a picture of our dearly passed dog, Barney, from years ago on there. And then there's a picture of me, which you took. Uh, in Slovakia <laughs> at said castle. And oh. I, I tease her about it because I'm like, well, I'm not dead. I'm still here. And in fact, I'm sleeping right beside you. Why do you need a picture of me at your bedside table? So anyway, it's a bit weird. So take comfort in knowing that, you know, even though we don't work closely together anymore, you you still have the ability to annoy me from afar. <laughs> I Well, that's might have been the biggest compliment <laughs> you've ever given me. <laughs> uh <laughs> traveling the world with you is <laughs> is entertaining it's different um would you try if we had to go on a month-long vacation on the amazing race would you take me along would we make it to the end i mean it would have to be a real good destination um <laughs> like I, there are part lots of parts of the world that i haven't been to uh i feel like i could could put up with you in hawaii for a month i've never been to hawaii uh, I've heard great things about Greece, parts of Italy. I've been to Italy, but I haven't been to the Amalfi Coast, things like that. I think I could deal with you for four consecutive weeks there. Um, would we make it without some sort of physical altercation? Probably <laughs> not. <laughs> but that cuts both ways, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah I mean, look, we're, 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 we're both motivated to uh to do what whatever the job requires but sometimes there's there's just some clash there there's just a difference of opinion those sorts of things but i thought we did well in slovakia to be fair i don't yeah. i don't remember there maybe one or two moments um but you, you know you're a guy who needs to work on his patience i don't know if lisa has told you that over the years but you're you're, you're somebody has. that yeah well and i'm kind of that way too to be fair so when when you get two short-tempered dudes who lack patience in close proximity day after day hour after hour week after week i mean there's going to be some healthy clash and that's what i uh, that's but it, but it would have to be greece it would have to be italy it would have to be hawaii it would have to be somewhere where i haven't been that i just want to get so like not stoville probably not stoville no <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that, by the way, Hamilton, that, Slo no. that Slovakia trip was, I think, the best trip I've ever been on. Um, and it happened to be because partly the hotel that we stayed at awesome. was a small boutique hotel. Yeah. And it was we met the owner, um, except for one night. I can't really remember when he brought in the homemade peach schnapps. Uh, oh, boy. <laughs> that uh -huh. I don't like I don't know how we function the next day. Well, and look. Uh, the innkeeper, um, I mean, this isn't like home brew. I mean, I guess in essence, it kind of was, wasn't it? But, you know, no, this this was refined um, recipe that had been in the family for, what, <clears throat> hundreds of years, like yeah. generations. Um, but it was potent. I, I don't think that I had as much as you because I think I, I was a bit smarter. I recognized that <laughs> this was going to turn ugly in a hurry. Uh, but I had had my share, you know. Just a small boast here, by the way. Remember, I think it was Dominica. Remember? Yep. Do, yeah. She yep. still follows me on Instagram. That's that's my Slovakian claim to fame. Uh, she still follows me. Uh, okay. Well, now I don't feel as good. Hmm. Um, she but... just got married, I want to say. Oh, is that right? I think oh, so. very good. We're a lot closer than you are, apparently. Yeah. Do you remember the, the only negative thing, and it's it's more of a European thing, not nah, that's generalizing. I mean, certainly Czech Republic, Paris, um, mm -hmm. the smoke smoking. Remember, we'd go into that little oh. bar 
at the inn that we stayed in in uh, in, De- in uh, Slovakia. And if you didn't get there at the right time, man, you were smoked out. Like we had a high tolerance for secondhand smoke on that trip. It's tough. And, and you, see, you can smell it in the arenas too. They try to yeah. hide it, whatever. But you can, it, it just, it's everywhere. It's very prevalent. Yeah. But, but anyway, uh, one of my favorite trips and you helped make it that way just because awesome. I, I think we just got along really well. Um, <laughs> you, you brought up like, clashes and stuff i mean you work with bob mckenzie pierre lebrun and we used to work with frank cervelli like you guys are the top of your game was yeah. is there how do you manage the egos that all of you have <laughs> since you put it that way um you know what well yeah i i think that in all truth that that's the history of success at, at tsn inside that hockey department um is that we collectively have always worked as a team you know i think of Bob and I and Pierre, especially Gordon Eller, throw him into that conversation sitting on set when healthy enough to do so, uh, trade deadlines and free agent yep. frenzies and all of that. Um, we divide and conquer. And it's never been about, okay, well, you know, I need to tweet it because it's my story or I need to break it on national TV because it's my story. No, that's not, that's not really how we operate. I mean, when you have something, you tweet it, whether it's breaking news or not. But there are lots of times when we're sitting on set and one of us will get a tip. Hey, check into this player. I think he signed wherever or trade deadline. You know, I'm hearing that this team is close on this trade and okay. You know, Bob will say, all right, well, I'm going to this guy, this guy, this guy. Uh, I'll say, okay, I'll go this direction. Pierre will go that direction. Gord helps where he can. And honestly, I, I believe that that has been uh, the main ingredient of our success is that we all have egos. You're not wrong. I don't think that you can work in the, the business of television period, no matter where you're working at in TV and not have a healthy level of self-esteem. So there's no shortage of that to be sure. But the fact that we can push that aside for the greater good and just making sure we get the story and get the story right. I think that's been a key element to the success long-term there. And I know it's not lip service because I watched it transpire for years. And so I've seen that all of you work together and there is no kind of yeah. ego that at each other or healthy shots. So I do, yeah. I do understand how well you work together. And Bob is always a treat uh, despite his, I don't know, legendary status. He's certainly mm-hmm. a pretty normal, humble guy. Um, it, it, Jamie has a book. Bob's got books. Duffy's got books. Where's the Dreger book? You know, I still come back and, and you're not the first person to ask this. And I've actually had publishers that have reached out to say, you know, everything from my backyard rink fascination in the winters yeah. uh, to growing up in Saskatchewan and, and, you know, kind of the weird way that I, I made it up to network television, all that I've been approached and I, I come back to the same thing and, and, you know, I'm 53. Um, so the better part of my career is probably behind me, obviously, but I still come back to who's going to read it. Why would you read that? <laughs> you know, Bob has got a collection of great stories, which, you know, he has, he has published. Um, and James, you know, he's, he's, he's just a character. And, you know, a lot of his stuff is, again, story-based or interview-based. I'm too lazy to do that. I, like, I, I could have written, I've had people approach me about helping them write a book. And again, when, when the off-season rolls around, I'm, I, I don't want to talk hockey for the most part. I just want to disappear. I want to go to the Western Canada where I'm a nobody um, and play golf and go fishing. And so for me to invest the time into writing somebody else's book, I'm not doing that. It's true. Uh, and I just, I mean, unless we're talking about a coffee table book, which the, the backyard rink book would be, I don't, I don't see anybody buying it or wanting to read it. So I don't know, maybe I'll have my mind changed in the years to come, but I doubt it. That's a good idea, though. A backyard coffee table. Yeah. Like, there's some, I think there's promise there, but I, I know like the time commitment is crazy. Yeah. And so that leads me into like, you work all the time. Like, what's the downtime? And especially this year, does it feel like the season's never going to end? Because you're probably on vacation about July 5th. Yeah. Normally. Normally. Um, you know, Wally, this, this year especially, Uh, I really feel like I'm at the end of the run. Um, It has been for everybody, you know, and I, I, I'm not suggesting I work harder than anybody else. I mean, we, we've all faced so many challenges personally, professionally, all of that. Um, But because one season just automatically rolled into another, 
we didn't, I, I didn't have as much time off as I normally would have last year, uh, last summer, um, and probably is going to get cut short again. You know, this year you've got Olympic camps and whatnot in early September and all that. But this year, more than any year that I can remember, I feel like I'm right at the end of it where I just need to turn off. And so I'm going to try and do that. I'm never very good at doing that, but I'm going to try real hard this year. So day after free agency. So later this week, I'm uh, flying into Thunder Bay. My daughter uh, has a house in Thunder Bay. She's going to law school at Lakehead. Uh, starting in September. So I'm going to pick her up in Thunder Bay. And then we're flying into Winnipeg uh, end of the week. And we bought a, a, well, they're called cabins out there, but here they're called cottages. So we affectionately refer to it as a cabbage, you know, half <laughs> cottage, half yeah. cabin, cabbage on Lake of the Prairies, uh, which I grew up on the Saskatchewan side of Lake of the Prairies. And the east side is the Manitoba side. So we bought a place there in the winter. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to spend a few weeks up there and just shut down and then come back here and play some golf. And hopefully that drags me into September and then we'll get back at it. But man, I, and again, I, I speak for you. I speak for everybody. It just feels like we need to stop, um, spend time with family and recharge, reset, and then get back at it in the fall. It's huge. Like we thought about going through it right into next season. And then we're like, by the time yeah. July first rolled, we're like, we need to have a break. And I, yeah. I understand you. And you add the podcast on top of that, plus all the yeah. radio interviews you do. Like, it's exhausting. Yeah. So, uh, and I know even before <laughs> after July first, I would always see you doing emails of people who signed free agents. Like, does it? When did it stop, or does it stop bothering you about missing a free agent signing or a trade or whatnot? <laughs> You know, when it stopped, it, it, you know, it, 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 you're right. It, it doesn't really stop. Where I, where I learned to accept it was shortly after Twitter really took hold. Social media kind of really came into our game. And the reason that is because, man, there's so many great beat reporters across sport, uh, across the National Hockey League. And they never had the platform. I mean, they, you know, the websites, the internet's been around forever. Of course, they could post their stuff on whatever website uh, they're working for, the newspapers, all of that. But the immediacy of Twitter really gave those great reporters a voice. Yeah. And so for a year or two, it pissed me off. Like, you know, uh, like a, a significant injury where a player was done for six months, needed knee surgery, all of that. We used to get those. Those were tap-ins because somebody in the organization would tip us off. You call the agent, the agent spills the beans, you know, you, you post something on a website or you break it on TV or on radio and you look like the king. And then all of a sudden, all of those key reports, the little detail stuff were, were coming out of city by city. And I'm like knocking my head against the wall going, man, I'm losing my touch. Well, I wasn't losing my touch. It's just, again, all these good reporters now at a venue to, you know, report what they're seeing minute by minute, yourself included, yeah. right? All the morning skates, the practices that you attended covering the Ottawa Senators. I mean, if Twitter was there in the early days, you know, you guys would have absolutely owned that market. But because it wasn't there, guys like Bob McKenzie would would report it and, you know, look like they were just the best there is. Uh, so that was when I, I had to learn to, all right, use it to your advantage, don't be chasing every sort of injury update unless it's a catastrophic or a star player that is, is really significantly injured. Use it as a tipping device, right? So, you know, now I follow all these beat reporters closely, but I use them as a resource um, for their information, number one. Uh, but number two, you know, maybe there is a tip in all of that. You know, some player is out long term. Well, you've got the trade deadline coming up. Guess what? General manager is now all of a sudden going to have to be in the market for some reinforcements, that sort of thing. So I probably learned to accept it, you know, year two, three into to Twitter. But I, hey, I'm competitive. You're very competitive. I, I still don't like getting beat on anything, but I guess I'm getting a little bit better with age. Uh, is there one, I guess, trade or something that you had that got you got beat on that really still bothers you? <clears throat> yeah. Roberto Luongo getting traded. Uh, to the uh, Florida Panthers. Um, now, keep in mind, Mike Keenan was the general manager of the Florida Panthers back then. 
Uh, Mike and I had worked closely together at, at Sportsnet, um, very good friends. And so he and I had, had talked about the reality of that trade happening. Um, and he, you know, I'll, I'll let you know, I'll let you know, I'll let you know. Dave Nonis, who is a family member, is general manager of the Vancouver Canucks at the time. Um, and, and I often say to people, especially here in Toronto, it, I mean, it just got nauseating all the, 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 the people out there who thought that Dave and I had a pipeline with each other. I mean, it couldn't be more opposite. He never gave me anything as an assistant general manager or a general manager. However, in this case, you've got Dave Nonis, who I'm close to know very well. Mike Keenan, who's a very, very good friend. If there were two general managers who should have been in my wheelhouse <laughs> and I had covered the story closely and had been speculating on, and then Bobby Mack was like hiding in a potted plant in a hotel lobby somewhere. I think it was just prior to the draft, whenever that trade went down. And he lobbed that out there. And I was just like, boom, head hit the desk going, because Bob is never wrong. It's not like, you know, some reporter just lobbing out some ridiculous phantom trade rumor. No, Bob is never wrong. And I was, I called Keenan and he's, yeah, sorry. I just, I was in the lobby and I ran into Bob and yeah, I couldn't lie to him. He asked me the question. <laughs> so that one left a mark, obviously, but I, I've actually, there's another one that, and it was my first big trade. It was when the Boston Bruins traded Joe Thornton to the San Jose Sharks. Marco Sturm, Wayne Primo. I still remember the elements of that trade. And um, God bless him. God rest his soul. Uh, the jo late John Ferguson Sr. Uh, was with the, the San Jose Sharks at the time. And I had gotten the tip somehow that this was probably going down. And I call Fergie and uh, he goes, yep just made the deal. And, and, you know, he was like in scouting or, you know, he wasn't the general manager, but he knew, and he broke down all the elements. So I lobbed that out there and that was pre Twitter. I put it on the website and there was crickets. Like nobody else was reporting. Um, you know, in fact, I think Bob McKenzie, I think TSN had a game that night and he referred to it during the intermission by saying, there is a report that Joe Thornton, you know, working on confirming that sort of thing. I was in a full sweat for hours because nobody was confirming this. Boston wasn't confirming nothing. <coughs> Excuse me, out of San Jose. I've got Bob McKenzie, the best in the business, saying there are a report out there. So finally, the trade got announced and I could breathe again. But yeah, it, so I went from... You know, again, the experience of being so sour over Luongo to prior to that, my first big trade, Joe Thornton, where he sweated bullets for like four hours until it was finally announced. That's wild. Um, just it reminds me of one time I remember, pre, and I think, I'm pretty sure it's pre Twitter because it's Brian Murray is the general manager at the time, mm. and it's Wade Redden. And I called oh, yeah. you and said, they're going to ask him to waive his no trade clause. And so you call Brian Murray and it's one of the best reactions. I think I'll let you finish the story because it, this story always makes me laugh. Well, you're going to have to help me fill in the gaps. I know how sour he was. Um, and I mean, he was, well, sour doesn't even quite describe it. I mean, again, God love him. You know, Brian was super protective of his players and the business uh, no matter where he was. And he was so offended that somehow we found out about it. Um, and he blamed everyone from the oh, yeah. agent to the player, to Wade's His dad, dad, to yeah. everybody. So what am I missing in there? Was there some, was there another element that I'm forgetting? No, I just in this remember story? So oh. you call me back and you yeah. called, you call Brian and he's driving somewhere. And I just remember something on the lines of, why can't I do anything without yeah. with my players without you ever knowing about it? Yeah, yeah, was, yeah. <laughs> but in case so in point, again, that that is a is a classic example to go back to the success of the insiders. You know, if you don't give me the heads up on that, then we obviously don't find out about it. But that, but it didn't end there either. So that was the call. So there, that's a good example of managers holding a grudge and. I remember I, I, it was years later, Wally, I remember seeing Brian at a, a general manager's meeting in Boca and he had been cold to me, like cold, like 
he would return my calls, but it would take a while and I'd have to pester him and all. I finally said to him at one of these GM meetings, Brian, like, did I do something to piss you off along the way here? And I think he actually said, well, not recently, but there was that time. <laughs> and he was referring to that story of, of uh, Wade Renton and asking for, or them asking for him to wave and, and how that got out and, and all of those things. So, man, these guys can hold a grudge. Oh, yeah. And now, is that the worst that GM's been mad at you? No. Um, so this is going back again pre-Twitter, but Brian Burke was a general manager of the Vancouver Canucks. I was hosting the national panel with Kiprios, uh, Billy Waters, I think was on that panel and Scott Morrison, or maybe John Garrett was on, doesn't matter. Uh, but Marcus Naslin uh, was injured. He had broken his leg. And we found out that the Vancouver Canucks had hung Naslin's sweater uh, right by the door and the players would tap it, you know, on their way out, just a show of tribute, inspiration, to the Vancouver Canucks players, you know, their captain, their leader wasn't able to play, but you know, they were going to do it for Marcus. Um, and I, I, I position it like that. I'm like, come on guys on national TV. I'm like, does that really work? I mean, you know, you're, you're like fist pumping an empty sweater. Like, how do you get inspired? And you can imagine Kipper, right? Kipper goes, ha, 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 ha. on TV. <laughs> that doesn't work. It's garbage, you know? And, so we, we literally spent 90 seconds having a chuckle at, while Brian Burke was so angry. So next morning, it's like 8 a.m. Eastern. So it's like 5 o'clock in the morning Pacific. My daughter is like 2, something like that. I'm feeding her breakfast. Phone rings. It's T.C. Carling, who's uh, in the media department for the Vancouver Canucks. Yeah, Drake, have you got a sec? Burke, wants to have a word with you. And I'm like, yeah, sure. And he's on speakerphone and he unleashed and I'm on speakerphone and it's a you effing blah, 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 blah. I have never heard anything more. And it got listened. Blah, blah, blah. And he just went on and on. And I'm trying to, you know, I've got my phone and I'm trying to get it off speakerphone because my, my toddler is sitting here listening to Brian Burke and this tirade. And finally, you know, look, I mean, you've probably seen it out of me. I've got some prairie temper and it doesn't matter. Like you can only be pushed so far. And finally I just go, Berkey, just shut up, just stop talking. And I'm like, you want to have this conversation? I'll get a camera into your office. Let's do it on TV. You know, you're calling me berating me, uh, berating me as I'm feeding my daughter breakfast. I said, you want to do this? Let's do it for real. And you know, he basically told me to pound sand and hung up on me. But the funnier part is who so that's whatever that whole sequence probably at last five minutes, but a half hour later, TC Carlin calls me back. He goes, Driggs, Berkey just wants to know if everything's good. Are you guys okay? <laughs> I'm like, I, I, I guess like, are we okay? He just yelled at me for five minutes. Yeah called me every name in the book with my daughter listing. <laughs> so that was, he was angry, but I've had, oh boy. You remember when, uh, I mean, it must've been, I think it was just before Yarmar Yager was traded to the Washington Capitals. Uh, and say there was general manager of the Rangers at the time. And I called and left him a message just say, hey, Slats, you know, there's, and I think it was somebody at the score, Steve Coolius or somebody way back in the day, reported that the Rangers are close to trading Yarmir Yager. So I leave a message. I'm like, Hey Glenn. And I knew slats a little bit from, uh, so I hosted a year of Oilers games in 97, 98. He was the general manager in Edmonton, which there's another funny story there. I'll tell quickly after I'm done here. So I leave him a message. I said, Hey, I'm just following up on a, a report here that you're, you're, you're close to a deal. And he calls me and he goes, Greg's, what do you leave me that message for? Like, do you think I'm going to tell you? Do you honestly think I'm going to? Yeah. Like he was so cynical and condescending and, and sarcastic. Do you honestly think that I'm close to trading a superstar? And one of the first things I'm going to do is pick up my phone and call Darren. Dreger. Ooh, I better call Darren Dreger because I, you know, <laughs> like, it, so it was, you, you left this message though. So I've had lots of exchanges, but the, the one that dates back to Edmonton, 
I'm green as grass. So hired from, um, well, it was CKY TV in Winnipeg, but it's CTV Winnipeg now uh, to host Oiler Games, be sports director of then a channel in Edmonton, a startup station, which was just unbelievable. The stuff that went on there. Wow. Um, so I'm the host uh, for the Oilers games on a channel. Uh, Bruce Buchanan, the play-by-play guy, Harry Neal and a collection of color commentators. It was just a fun, fun time, but we needed to be cutting edge Wally. So we're the new kids on the block and, and, you know, we couldn't be in shirt and tie, you know, everybody else was doing games in shirt and tie, no different than they are today. We had the mock turtlenecks. So (laughs) if you can imagine Harry Neal in a mock turtleneck now, I'm like, I don't know. I was probably 29, 30 years old. I was in much better shape than I am now. I, I look pretty good if I don't say so myself. And Bucky was a svelte guy. So here we are in our promo shoot with all black jackets and these. So anyway, we do our first game in San Jose. And Kelly Buckberger is the captain of the Edmonton Oilers. So we do the game, come back. Two days later, the Oilers first practice. I'm, I'm standing beside the, the glass and Bookberger comes off to the bench and he waves me over and he goes, Hey, he goes, heads up. He goes, slats is he's out to get you. And I'm like, what? Like, what did I, did I say something? No, nah, he goes, he's just, he's angry about you guys aren't wearing ties. So he said, just heads up. Cause he's looking for you today. I'm like, okay. You know, and I'm terrified. It's Glenn Sather. I mean, yeah. what the hell? So nothing happens. Practice continues. Get into uh, the dressing room. And, and that was back in the day where Glenn basically had a rule. Unless you're on the trainer's table, you had to be sitting in your stall. I'll give the man credit. He had full accountability. He wanted the media to have access to every player from Doug Waite to, you know, the seventh defenseman. Goalies, wow. you had to be in your stall. You had to be ready to be interviewed. So I walk in there and all the media is there. The entire room is full. All of a sudden, Glenn walks in from the back of the room through the trainer's area and he goes, Drager, Drager. And everybody goes dead quiet in this dressing room. I'm like, uh, yeah, slots like across the room. And he goes, this is the effing national hockey league. What was that nonsense? The other night we wear effing ties in the national hockey league. And if you want to stay in the effing national hockey league, you're going to put an effing tie on. Are we understood? <laughs> I'm like, understood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't and imagine the, what that's like. Oh, and all, yeah, all the players are just killing themselves laughing at me. <laughs> so anyway, I've had a few run-ins over the years, Brent. He doesn't like TSN. He uh, he used to, I remember, would bump the camera guys. He'd walk yeah, by yeah. in scrums. He, he really didn't like TSN. You know, ornery, ornery, ornery dude. But uh, similar to Berkey, um, he respects experience uh and he respects a little bite so you know the only way to 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 get to a bully is to bully right back right confront it and say it's not happening anymore so once slots and i kind of crossed that bridge no different than brian we had a different relationship so they're good guys uh you brought up mike keenan earlier do you still have his car and has he ever asked for it back yeah you know what there's a story there he has never asked for it back, um, but I, I, there's there's some type of documentary that's <clears throat> being planned for Mike Keenan. I'm not sure of all the details, so I probably shouldn't say more. Now. I'm not involved, so it doesn't really matter to me. Um, but I got a like a a random call like six months ago, asking that very question: Do you still have Mike Keenan's Mercedes? I said, Well, no, it's my Mercedes, but if you're <laughs> yes, I I do. Uh, and the backstory is, so Mike uh, coaching the Philadelphia Flyers in 1985, I guess it was, uh, Ed Snyder, the owner of the Philadelphia Flyers, they're not supposed to do anything that year. They make it to the Stanley Cup final. And Ed Snyder is just over the moon with the success of this team. So in appreciation, he either buys or leases Keenan uh, this 1985 convertible Mercedes, beautiful, beautiful car back then 380 SL. And so, you know, I I've had the privilege of visiting with Mike. Uh, he's got a, a cottage compound. I call it because there's more than one cottage on it on Georgian Bay, um, Port McNichol. 
So he shows me this car like 10 years ago and it's dusty parked inside his garage at his, at his cottage hasn't been driven in like years. And I'm like, what are you doing with this car? I don't know. I'm like, well, you got to sell it. And he's, ah, you know what? It's nostalgic. I don't want to sell it. And I'm like, okay, well, if you ever want to sell it, then let me know. So we're at a world championship, Paris and Cologne a few years ago. And Mike is there. I think he's still working in the KHL at that point. We're walking over to the rink. He's staying in the same hotel. And he goes, Greg, do you still want to buy that car? I'm like, yeah, sure. Why not? He goes, okay, well, I'll, you know, let's get back to North America. We'll talk about it. So true to his word, he calls me two weeks later and he goes, well, he goes, I don't know. I'm thinking about 19, 20,000. I'm like, Mike, I'm not giving you $20,000 for that car. Forget it. I like, I like the, the story behind it. Now there's a bit more of a backstory. So Keenan and the flyers, things don't go so well. And Snyder fires Keenan and then wants the car back. He wants it back. <laughs> and so I think Alan Eagleson somehow got involved and there's a story I've got it on a wall here. And and Eagleson basically guilts Ed Snyder and saying, OK, well, he can give you the car back. But then tomorrow in the Philadelphia Inquirer is going to be the front page of the car and you being described as the cheapest owner in the National Hockey League. So how's that going to work? And all right, forget it. He can keep the car. So he kept the car. So Mike offers to sell me the car. I'm not giving you 20000 He goes, oh, I don't know. What do you think it's worth? I'm like, well, I, I don't, I don't know, but I know I'm not giving you 20. Okay. Well, give me a couple of days. Calls me back a couple of days. Okay. I've thought it through. He goes, I'll sell it to you for $9,999 and 99 cents. I'm like, what? Why all the nines? He goes, because if you remember in 1985, we lose the Stanley cup final to the Edmonton Oilers and Wayne Gretzky was savage in that series <laughs> against us. So that'll be a constant reminder to both of us that Wayne Gretzky took us apart in 85. So that's what I paid for $9,999.99. And so I made him write that story out and then autograph it so that it it's an authentic piece of nostalgia. But I have had the producer of this documentary is trying to buy it from me for the, and I'm like, why do you need to buy it? Like if the, just use it, I'll give it to you as a prop for a month. Yeah. I don't drive it very often. So anyway, we were still sort of in negotiations, but I do still have it. That's outstanding. That's a great story. I, <laughs> there's lots of that stuff that always, you try to find a way to get those stories out. And when they do, they're always so good. Um, yeah. A couple of questions, NHL wise. Now, favorite yeah. day on the NHL calendar for you, is it free agent day or is it trade day? What is it? No, it's free agent frenzy. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, be, because it signifies the end of the mm. season. <clears throat> so that's <laughs> that's that's a pretty big deal for for those of us who've been grinding it out for the year. Um, but it's also more opportunistic, right? Because now it's it's not just a team source. I mean, obviously, the the agents are very very involved, and and the players are involved. Yeah. You know, around trade deadline. Sometimes the players are the last to know. And, you know, we talked about how the managers would get surly with us. Well, again, you go back a decade or more and, you know, the managers would, would just, I mean, they, they would threaten to pull deals off the table if we would speculate on, Hey, don't be surprised if this deal, I remember Kevin Lowe, manager of the Edmonton Oilers made the trade. It was the Yanni Ninema trade with the New York Islanders. And I speculated on this on air and low called was it gar snow or whoever was the manager of the islanders and threatened to scuttle the deal because somebody had leaked it and he believed that it was nobody within the oilers organization even though it was somebody within the oilers organization <laughs> who leaked it and so now that like they were so super sensitive back then now not so much right they just they've learned to live with it because of social media uh, but there's just more opportunity through a variety of sources on free agent frenzy to get the information. So I, 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 I prefer the frenzy over trade deadline. Uh, do you read your Twitter mentions? Uh, yes, but not very often. Um, I, there was a time and, and there are stretches for our, and I talk about this all the time, like Ray has a healthy ability to shut off Twitter and, mm. So when we get done, and it's his story to tell, 
Um, you know, he's challenged himself to go off Twitter. And I mean, off Twitter for an entire month, not look at Twitter. Don't participate in any of that. I can't do that because of what I do for a living. Um, I can tell you that, you know, the whole Mitch Marner experience for me, it didn't really get to me, um, you know, calling me Paul and all the nonsense. Paul Miner, of course, is the father of Mitch. And everybody thought that Paul Miner was feeding me, even though Paul Miner and I never had a single conversation or exchange about Mitch prior to his extension with the Maple Leafs. Anyway, um, yeah, I mean, that taught me not to read the replies. Yeah. And, then, and, and I, but I do. I do on occasion. It depends on what I'm tweeting about. Um, but I, I try my best to stay away from it. Uh, and how did, are your kids okay with it now? Cause they've obviously gone through it a lot, but like, it must've been at one point trying to talk to them. Cause it's like, it's a vicious world. A lot of times, yeah. especially for you and like 1.5 million followers. That's yeah. a lot of stuff people get to say. Yeah. You know, my son now is in the hockey business. He works for Okanagan, Ontario, uh, hockey Academy here. Um, it's part of his co-op. He's still in Guelph university. So now he, you know, again, he has to follow hockey Twitter because that's part of, of what he does and he helps coach and all of those things. Um, and I don't think he takes it personally. I think he's just more in tune now with some of the nonsense that goes on around my, my reporting. My daughter is a little bit older than my son. Um, so, you know, she follows it less now than she used to. Uh, but I can tell you all, and you, you know, you're probably the same. I, I set some pretty rigid um, boundaries with my kids when they were small, um, especially with my son in hockey. You know, I just, you know, those kids have, have grown up in, in social media. So they use it differently than we do. They use it as a form of, of entertainment and communication. And it seems like our generation uses it either to pass along information or to just be negative and go after people. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we, we haven't figured that part out yet, which is sad for the most part, but I remember, uh, and again, we're probably talking pre-social media, but you know, I would have people, I had an altercation one time. I kid you not. I think it was in a Walmart here in, in Toronto with my two kids in the middle of summer. And this guy is, I can hear him. He's, he's probably 25, 30 feet away. But I can hear him. He's talking to a buddy and he's like a grown man. And he's like, hey, that's Darren Greger. That's Darren Greger. And I'm like, you know, look, I'm always very engaging. You know, no different. Somebody comes up to you. Hey, Brent, you know, I just want to introduce myself. Of course, you're going to be courteous. Give that person two minutes of your life. It, it's not hurting anybody. Um, but I don't like it when that kind of thing happens, because especially when I'm with my kids anyway. This guy, he doesn't make a point of coming up to me and saying, hey, Darren, you know, I want to introduce myself. My name is Jeff, blah, blah, blah. Huge fan. He grabs me by the arm as I like I'm walking away and he he's kind of sneaks up behind me and grabs me by the arm. He goes, hey, Dreger. He goes, I want to talk to you about something. I'm like, take your hand off my arm. And I said, I'm with my kids. And I said, I'm you and I, this isn't going to end in a pleasant way if you don't leave my vicinity immediately. And my wires were touching. Like it's the first one and only time in a fan interaction where I've gone, okay, just calm yourself down, calm yourself yeah. down, calm yourself down. So, um, and I, you know, I had a couple of times after that and I, and, and more pleasant where I would just say, you know what? Um, I, I got lots of time, but I said, look, you can see I'm with my kids and uh, I got to get going, but I appreciate your interest. So, you know, that doesn't necessarily dive back into the social media conversation, but my, my kids have grown up with it. And I don't think that there have been too many situations where they've been shocked by anything that's been directed my way. Yeah, it's, it's a tough environment. I will say uh, when it comes to fan interaction, I had to have security in Philadelphia to do stand-ups one year when the Sens were playing because it's so bad in Philadelphia. I had one person yell in my ear, and I'm convinced to this day, we're live on camera. No, we're yeah. just about to go on camera. And I believe they've permanently damaged the hearing in my ear because they just screamed oh. in my ear. Like, Was that wild. in the building or outside? Yeah, we're in the I, building. I think it was the same series, and I think I was doing something. I think it's parking cup lot. final. 
and it was bananas. Like I, I got it there. There are certain cities yeah. where anything goes and yeah. inside, outside, that certainly applies to Philadelphia. Uh, quickly, just on some NHL yeah. topics, it's, it, we're coming up to free agent day here. And, and so you get to have a little vacation after, but one is before we get there, your thoughts on Logan Mayu and what the Habs did and how the, uh, to me, this is on the NHL, not so much on, I guess, Logan Mayu is yeah. why did the Habs or why did the NHL allow this to happen? Yeah. I, well, I guess, legally speaking, Wally, um, yeah. th- there wasn't much choice. I mean, you can't opt in or opt out, even though, you know, Logan tried to denounce uh, and encourage teams not to take them. Uh, and I look, there are some who think that that was just wallpaper and he was just in full damage control. Well, I mean, obviously he's in damage control, but I, I, I took it as a sincere um, embracement of, of the growing that he knows that he has to be a part of. Right. Yeah. So I, but I I've used the term tone deaf and that for me best describes what the Montreal Canadians um, showed us, you know, through this, Hey, I wasn't at all surprised that Logan Malieu was drafted. Uh, I think he's a quality enough hockey player, uh, deserving from a hockey perspective of being acknowledged as uh, an NHL prospect. I understand that, but how could you be so naive, if not ignorant, of what the backlash and everything that we have experienced since they took him in the first round How could you not know that was coming? And if you didn't know that was coming, well, then you've got to get people that are better prepared and equipped to handle situations like this. And if you expected it and were okay with that, isn't that even worse? Because it it seems they are. They had a press release ready. Yeah. They had a ready. So clearly they're like, we're going to do this. But that's, we all come back to, and for us who love the game, we don't like the, the hockey culture that surrounds it or part of it. Right. And it's not for, and, it's not everywhere and it's not everybody, but this is one of those things where people who want to harp on how hockey culture is yeah. have this case to point to. And it's like, it's right in front of yeah. you. Well, and look, um, everything about this case needs to be acknowledged, starting with the rights of the victim. Um, this young woman is the person that we should be thinking about and, and concerned about her well-being moving forward, uh, how this is going to impact her long-term, all of that. That's, That's the only thing that matters. But I do believe in second chances and in some cases, third chances. But when you're drafted in the first round of the National Hockey League draft, that's not giving a kid a second chance. Giving Logan a second chance is perhaps drafting him late or not drafting him at all, um, respecting his wishes not to be drafted, and letting him go through the growth uh, process, the counseling that he has committed to going through and is working his way back into the hockey community. That to me is what a second chance is. Not not getting drafted in the first round. So to go back to your question, I believe now the National Hockey League has to walk hand in hand with the Montreal Canadiens. And, And what I mean by that is the NHL, the commissioner's office, should be in lockstep with Mark Bergevin and the Montreal Canadiens in making sure this young man does everything that is expected of him in terms of the counseling and, and all of the programming that he's going to have to go through. And if he misses one counseling session, the commissioner's office should be on line one to Mark Bergevin saying, what happened? He needs to get back in there right now Um, because otherwise there is another layer of, of disconnect. That's, it's not fair. It's not acceptable. And you know, this Brent, um, there are so many great reporters who cover stories like this. You know, I I'm often criticized. Well, why haven't you said more? Why don't you report on what's going on in Chicago? Why don't you report on Logan Mayu and all? Because there are great reporters like Katie Strang and Rick Westhead and all the good people who are reporting on the Chicago case in Chicago that are doing the story it's justice so um i stay on top of these things i provide an opinion when guys like you ask me for it but in this case with the montreal canadians it just didn't have to be i mean if if they draft logan in the fourth round as an example or, or there's still backlash 
There's still yep. backlash because, you know, the, the league, the, the team ignored his wishes, um, but not to this degree. I mean, you're rewarding the young man by drafting him in the first exactly. round. Yeah, I thought Bob McKenzie had great tweets. Um, Terrific. To talk about backlash, and this isn't anywhere to make a yeah. joke moving to the next one, but the Seattle expansion, you and, and mostly Frank Zervalli got, well, I don't know. Like, are you like, is everybody okay with the way that the expansion draft happened and now all the names got leaked out before? No, that? no, no. And look, uh, Frank was a rock star uh, yeah. that day. He Absolutely. did his job. He did his job. And, you know, again, if, when, when you have a deadline at 10 a.m. Eastern for the Seattle Kraken to put in their submission list of the players that they're selecting and your live show isn't 10 hours later till 8 p.m., what do you think is going to happen? You know, um, yeah, I poked a few out there. Uh, I knew a few more, but I was asked not to say anything, so I didn't say anything. Um, so, I, you know, who I felt bad for. I felt bad for some of the players. I felt bad for the 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 seattle kraken in general sure. i mean the kraken paid 650 million dollars for the expansion rights and part of that would have been to own the spotlight not just the exclusive uh, exclusivity window uh, and everything that went into you know where they're at today but that was a part of it and you know, yeah, I mean, from having the, the the sports celebrities there, there was no polish on that process because there was nothing intriguing about it other than, you know, firming and confirming what we already knew. So it was too bad. But and I, you know what, not to put words in, in Frank's mouth here, but I think he felt a little uneasy uh, in doing it, but he was doing his job. I fully support and endorse it. Yeah. Um and, you know, I, 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 he probably took a few body blows from some who, di- who don't understand the process and who are furious. I mean, Bobby Mack did the same thing on, uh, on Friday night, right? Yeah. In, in tweeting yeah. the picks out before they were made. And I did a couple of those too. And you asked about reading replies. I mean, there were some angry people who were pissed. <laughs> they were sour that we were doing that because it was spoiling the intrigue of the event. Didn't you tweet something right after the expansion to say, should we reveal something? Yeah, Didn't yeah, the, the schedule, the NHL yeah. schedule. Yeah. yeah, there's nothing like poking the bear, Drake. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, uh, I knew I knew Montreal was drafting Logan two minutes before they picked, and I, I didn't have the, the gonads to put it out there. I was like, uh, I, I think I put the, the, the wide-eyed emoji <laughs> That was my tweet because I didn't have the stones to say Logan Melieu is being drafted by the Montreal Canadiens. I said it to Bob. I'm like, Bob, tweet this. He goes, no way. I'm like, yep, that's who they're taking. So we so just uh, let the grenade explode. Finally, before I let you go, I know I've kept you too long. It's uh, the Ottawa Senators. Do you expect them to do anything in free agency here? Uh, well, nothing front burner, but I mean, we know Pierre Dorian and how he works. Um He's a bargain hunter and he's done good work in that regard. So I think that he's, he's going to be patient, but Wally, you know, it's an impressive team, isn't it? Um, I like their draft. I thought that they did fine. I know that there's been, you know, some debate over whether they took Tyler Boucher too high or not. Um, you know, for me, the most intriguing part of the off season is Brady Chuck in the contract. And what is that going to look like? When are they going to get it done? All of those things. Um, but I doubt that they make a, a big splash. You know, I still look at some trading elements. Uh, Chris Turney can go down the list. But I, I think Ottawa's going to have an excellent team. But I, I don't think that there's anything really front burner. Do they get Kachuk done here soon? I mean, both sides are super secretive, uh, which is perfect, right? That's the way that Dorian wants to do business. Uh, Newport is very respectful. That's how they have, have kind of managed all their top end guys. Uh, Shabbat go down the list. I can understand that because things are, are tense enough and get complicated enough without you, me, and, and everybody in the media doing play by play, hour by hour and minute by minute. <laughs> I think it gets done. Um, but what's the magic number? You know, we're, we're not going to know that. Is it a shorter term? Is it a longer term? 
I just know how important Brady Kachuk is to the Ottawa Senators. So when you're lobbing out eight year, $64 million deals, to Thomas Shabbat, then you'd better be able to step up on the next guy. And the next guy is clearly Brady. Does he, he gets more, doesn't he? I think so. Yeah, I think so. Cause you know, again, um, he break down the identity of, of the Ottawa senators. Right. And if, if you think that Shabbat is a key element to the back end, which he is, um, then a key element up front has got to be, has to be Brady Kachuk. So, you know, he certainly, whether he gets more, I guess is why you negotiate, but I, I think you will in different positions, but you look at the contracts that we've already seen, right. Kale McCarr getting 9 million in his extension with Colorado and Seth Jones getting that mega deal from the Chicago Blackhawks after the trade. So even though, again, different positions, uh, level of importance is just as high for me. So I think Brady's going to get a real beefy number. Well, well, I agree with you on that. And clearly we agree on a lot because we're wearing the yeah. same shirt. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't want to take any more of your time, but I knew, I will say Ottawa Senator fans, blessed to have you on the broadcast. Not only do they get to see you nationally, but they also get to see you a lot more than most people do. So uh, we appreciate you here in Ottawa and all the work you have done. And I just like to call you my friend. So uh, thanks for coming, yeah, we'll always be friends, buddy. And uh, look, yeah. I can tell you this, you've never look better than you look today. So hold on a minute. Cause I want to take a picture to make sure that I'm going to sit up straight, make sure there we go. Perfect. Now I've got it. We're set. Thanks pal. Take care. All right. Well, thanks everybody. All right. Time to announce the big ticket giveaway contest presented by Barhaven Ford. Now the contest was simple, right? All you had to do was go to barhavenford.com, enter who the Ottawa Senators were going to select at 10, and then you'd win uh, four tickets to the Sens home opener against Toronto Maple Leafs. Over a thousand people entered this contest and not shockingly, none of you got it right. Not one person because the Senators went off the board and nobody saw Tyler Boucher going to be selected at 10th overall. So the people at Barhaven Ford took all the names put them in a big drum, and then randomly selected a winner. And that is, congrats, Justin Goche. You are the winner of four tickets. Enjoy the game. This, uh, Bar even four people will be reaching out to you shortly. Uh, a fantastic prize. And so uh, enjoy mm-hmm. watching the Ottawa Senators beat the Toronto Maple Leafs on opening night. Uh, time now for On the Points, brought to you by sportsinteraction.com slash Wally and the Thought. Sports Interaction, Canada's odds makers. Log on to sportsinteraction.com slash Wally and the Thought. Get in on the action. So, Speaking of action, Matt, while there may not be any hockey, there's lots going on in Tokyo at the Olympics. And on Friday, I guess it's the main event, or it used to be with, you know, Usain Bolt was there and everything. It's the men's 100 meter final. Uh, Are you paying attention to the Olympics much? Nope. Okay, good. I mean, I had it on. That's a lie. Okay. (laughs) I had it on today. Today's the first day I've actually had it on. I started this morning, first thing in the morning when the kids woke up, I said, nope. We are not watching Paw Patrol this morning. Dad's watching <laughs> the Olympics. So I've had it on. I had the USA basketball game on, and I watched some yeah. of the, 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 the women's gymnastics. We were kind of flip-flopping a little bit. and uh, But I, I like it. There's just so many events now. They're not even skateboarding. It's crazy. So yeah. Um, yeah. there's plenty. There's but, but, you know, plenty of content. So I'm a huge fan of it. I just... It takes me a while to get going here, Wally. And without you saying in there right now, I'm just trying to find new, new people yeah. to cheer on. And so, and then there's been a lot of like three on three basketball is another one, but congrats to the, uh, the Canadian swimming team led by yeah, Penny Alexiak. Penny Alexiak that, right? yeah. They won a silver medal. I think Canada's yeah. first medal at the Olympics. Uh, all yeah, right. Yesterday. So, so let's just break it down here to the men's 100 meter final that there is no Usain Bolt. Uh, Canadian Andre de Grasse is in it. We'll get to him in a sec. Do you, who do you think is going to win? Trevon uh, Brommel is uh, the odds on favorite. He's apparently the man to beat as he's won six of the last seven 100 meter races this year. Well, where's DeGrasse ranked right now? He's on all the cereal boxes in Canada. He's got to be vying for some kind of medal. No. And we he, know he's done a great job. He finished. Where did he finish when he fought, when he um, raced with Usain at the last day? He was silver. So I remember mean, the bromance that those two had. They were yeah, hugging each other. Cool. I know he's a lot smaller. He's a little shorter. He's not exactly, yeah. he doesn't have the same stature as Usain, but he's a fantastic athlete. And I'm going to be cheering him on. I'm not betting against a Canadian. That's, that's blasphemy. So I'm going for DeGrasse and I'm, I'm praying that he at least, you know, he at least, he at least pulls, you know, bronze, silver would be great. Gold would be even better. 
I, I got a feeling the Americans might go one, two, three on the podium. Yeah, all of them have run sub tens. <laughs> They're all subs. You, uh, sorry, Andre de Grasse is uh, a plus 786 to win. It's not a bad bet to take. I, you know what? I, I mean, there's a chance the Olympics, anything happens, right? And so it all comes down to that one shot. And who knows if the other guys get off to a slow start, whatever happens. Agreed. But we can't, uh, we'll have to pick the go daddy guy. So uh, Andre de Grasse <laughs> is our favorite to win. Go make your picks. That's uh, on the points brought to you sport by sportsinteraction.com slash volume of thought. Get in on the action, make your uh, picks today. Canada's odds maker, sportsinteraction.com slash volume of thought. All right, let's welcome back into the show. Craig, uh, Guys, what's up? It, it seems like the perfect time here because as you spent so much work time working with the Ottawa Senators in mm. and around and knew all the stuff that was going on, this past weekend with the draft, uh, the trade for Eric Carlson is now complete. And both of you obviously know Eric Carlson very well. Mm. So it seems fittingly with so many faces involved in this trade that this is brought to you by Faces Magazine. Um, by the way, their latest issue uh, at facesmag.ca, there's a story on Ottawa's Broadway stars talking about the reopening of, of Broadway in New York. Uh, before we get to the Eric Carlson trade, I'm just, has either one of you ever gone to a Broadway musical? Yeah. No, Matt, I see this, just this look of confusion. On yeah, I went to, I saw it was, was, I don't know if it's considered a musical. Maybe it is. It was called Avenue Q in, in, in New York off, on Broadway, or maybe it was a show off Broadway, but it was really, really good. Um, but it, Probably not along the lines that you guys are talking about, like the Jersey Boys or something. I got uh, one. Yeah. I got one. Yeah. I, um, my in laws, uh, they took us to go see, it was literally like opening weekend. It was a Rocky Horror Picture Show. I, I'd never seen it. I mean, that wasn't really my thing. They're like, I kind of knew what it was. I'm not an idiot. Uh, but we, it was weird. It was like, there was no stage. It was kind of like ground level. And we were sitting like front row center. So I was like, it was a little much for me. Like I had a lot of guys and girls and dudes and grinding. And I was just like, <laughs> what is this? Like, I wanted to see a show. Like they were singing and dancing. Everybody knew all the things to, to yell out and say. And so, I didn't know. Um, who was Dick Cavett? He was the like host or whatever. I, hung out, I talked to him for a second. I was like, I don't know what's going on, man. Cool. Uh, it was good, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not a big Broadway guy, though. So that was probably not a good toe to dip in first. The Rocky yeah. Rocky for show. So I don't know. <laughs> I, I've seen a couple. One is once. It was a very good one. And the other one was Jersey Boys, as you mentioned, Beth. But the first one I ever went to was in Vegas. It's called Love by the Beatles. But the thing was, we took the Stanley Cup down to Vegas and we toured around with it for like three days and it was given VIP treatment. So we took it to this show. But in the car with us, Luke Shen, uh, Braden Shen, and Pavel Datsuk. So this is the strangest combination of people I've ever been. But anyway, Pavel Datsuk's in the car. We're chatting, like, we're barely chatting. And he's got some other Russian friend with him. Like, I, I just, it's so awkward that there's no conversation. Anyway, yeah, we go do the show and then we take the Stanley Cup out back. And it's a lot of Canadians because it's a Cirque du Soleil event. And so there's a lot of Canadians. They're going to meet the Stanley Cup. They got jerseys on and they're fawning all over. So you can tell how much the trophy is loved by it when you get to show it with other people. Uh, that's a show I'll never forget. And then all of a sudden, Pavel Datsuk is just gone. I'm like, this is so bizarre. <laughs> that was my first ever Broadway show I got to see. Loved by uh, the Beatles. Nice, okay. nice. Yeah. Very good. Man, I, bet. I don't, still don't understand how it all went down. Anyway, back to the topic at hand. That's the Eric Carlson trade. So um, the reason it's now finalized is because Zach Ostopchuk was selected in the second round. So here's the trade as it now all plays out because all the picks have been used. Zach Ostopchuk, Tim Stutzla, Matt Sogard, Josh Norris, Chris Tierney, Dylan DeMello, and Rudolph Balsers for Eric Carlson and Francis Perron. Would either one of you not make that deal today if you're the <laughs> Ottawa Senators? I mean, it, that's one of those ones that it was a hockey trade then. Like, it was just a lot for, like, usually when you lose the best player in a trade, you lose the trade, right? Yeah. Like, that's typically how trades work. Like, if you give up the best piece and you get back a lot, it's rare that a lot, like, they just, they got some really good pieces and they really were. I out. agree. So, I mean, if looking at it at the time, would I have thought like, Hey, let's trade Eric Carlson? Like, no, I didn't, I didn't think it was a fantastic idea, but you could sell me on that being a hockey trade. Like, I mean, meth defense, what's a defenseman's prime, right? Like Eric Carlson had probably played his best years in Ottawa. Like that's not yeah. be, like, that's kind of how it works. So well, I mean, we can't argue. We can't argue with it. Look at the numbers. Yeah, so it's was, not like we're saying anything crazy here. No, it's legit. Yeah, no, you're I right. Think, so, and, I think, would you? No, make I was just going to add to that, though. Like, we also didn't know 
what would happen to us like with his with his Achilles and his and his healing and with the injury that had happened. We you can't project what he'll be like in three years from then. But obviously Otto had a bit of a clue what, with what was going on, and maybe they felt that was the time to do it. And, and it's interesting because we, I mean, now we have the benefit of hindsight, and so it's easy to go, oh well, this. But you didn't know exactly. what those picks were going to be. But knowing what they are now. Like, would you do Tim Stutzla for Eric Carlson or Tim Stutzla and Josh Norris for Eric Carlson straight up? Probably not. If you're San Jose, probably not. Yeah. yeah. With what with what you know now, probably yeah. not. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it, looking back on that day, a lot of people <laughs> were very were very upset. And so, I mean, you, if you can take the emotion out of it and you have like three years to digest it, like, yeah, probably there's probably way. Like, it turned out as good as i think we could have hoped but i mean yeah. there's other trades like the mark stone one where you're just like ah crap like that one hasn't looked good yet and um it could still could i don't know but uh looking at this Eric carlson one like it's been more palatable because you can see the tim stutzlis and josh norris and you can fall in love with dylan Demello, and you have all these like things along the way and you just haven't had that with some other ones yet so i mean it's mm. not a knock on eric carlson like he look what he did not at all this year right like i mean he, he this is the kind of haul he should command like at where yep. he was and he did and it's just it's rare that this many things kind of seemingly work out so far so yeah i mean in hindsight it's pretty pretty much a slam dunk beth i'm just curious because you know eric very well and obviously we all know how your relationship is what what did you know at the time was going on because you were gone the year before if you will or i guess months before how did you see this all playing out? I don't, I don't know. I mean, we, we, when I was there and we finished up in 2017, I mean, aside from, aside from the expansion draft, I think all those guys felt pretty good about themselves and about where their game was. I mean, hell, you're, you're one goal away from the Stanley cup final and we did a great job against Pittsburgh. So I think, I think the team for the most part felt like they were heading in the right direction. And I don't think as a player on that team, if you're Eric or anybody else that you thought that that year was a one-off. I know a lot of people kind of thought we just, you know, we, we, we hit the ground running. We got a little fortunate kind of like Montreal this year and maybe they're correct, but at the time being in that room, it felt legitimate and it felt like it was earned. So if you're Eric going into that next year, you know, you're hoping that you can get a new partner and that things can work out and that you per keep progressing, but it just didn't work. It just didn't work out that way. Right. And um, things just slowly started to fall apart internally. And, you know, and then if, if you're Eric and you see an opportunity and you think, okay, maybe I'll end up in San Jose. That's not too, I mean, at the time seemed like a pretty good idea, right? I mean, you're going to go out there and it probably still is in his mind. He's, he's living a great life out there. He's got a beautiful home. You know, him and Melinda are very happy and as they should be. And he's got a nice new deal. He deserves to have gotten paid. I mean, good for him. But you can't look back and dwell on what has happened now because I don't think anybody would have predicted it. It was just one of those strange circumstances that slowly had a ripple ripple effect, excuse me, throughout the rest of the team. And things just went downhill from there with Ottawa. But now they're back. So it's all good. <laughs> when, I love how you spin that. When, when you like I, I know you guys still talked after you left when did you know or did you ever have conversations with him that he was not coming back like he he wanted out oh man he he was he was so tight-lipped about all that stuff like really? he wouldn't tell me anything he didn't tell I mean I don't know maybe he was telling other guys stuff but I had never heard anything I wish I had some juicy stuff to share but I think for me as an outsider I was just scanning Twitter right like looking for news and rumors and any of there's any local beat writers or anybody that's posting new stuff about it and giving me updates. But um, as far as I was concerned, I mean, he was relatively healthy in the playoffs. He, I mean, for the most part, I mean, he had an issue with his foot and, and yep. all that, but I mean, he was playing great hockey and I just assumed that going into the next year, he was going to be the same guy and that the team was going to be on that same track and it just didn't work out that way. So as far as Eric goes and knowing ahead of time with regards to those deals, I had no idea. He, that guy is a steel trap. When it comes to his personal stuff, he does not share a lot of information. Uh, Craig, for you, I, I, are you being told to prep anything in the back? Like, I know on that day he was traded was the first day of training camp where guys are just mulling about doing their physicals and all that stuff. And we knew that he wasn't around until probably he got traded. I think he came in like two in the afternoon, maybe later. Uh, yeah. Like, are you are you guys privy to anything that's going on here? Not really. So, so on that first day, like you guys are all media are kind of all waiting for people to be brought out to talk to you guys. Like on our mm -hmm. end, we're doing kind of the back end stuff, right? Filming some fun things, meeting guys like headshots are happening at the same time, right? And the physicals and things like that. So we're busy. 
um, we just know Eric's not there. Uh, and yeah. then eventually someone kind of comes over and says like, yeah, uh, just, Hey, be, be wrapped up this by a certain time. Cause you guys are going to have something else to do. So we kind of clued mm. in, but players were coming in and they're asking us to so like, have you heard anything? And we're like, no. So we, it was, uh, it was a weird day. Yeah. Um, and then kind of the rest of the stuff, like the rest of the day unfolds, right. Where, uh, you find out what the return is and everybody's freaking out. It basically, those are days where just your, your social media is shot. Stop doing anything. Don't post anything. It's like Montreal, right? You make that pick and then you try and post anything else. Like it's just going to get shredded. So you basically yeah. just have to go, okay, what's the bare minimum we can do now while we let this kind of go. And it's hard because you want to get guys excited about Josh Norris. And I'm yeah. like, you want to get people it was the excited first day about- of camp. Yeah. Yeah. And instead it was just kind of, so I think they moved on from that pretty quickly. That was content wise. That was a challenge for us. Right. Is like getting people to move on from Eric Carlson. Right. Like that was yeah. the challenge. It, it started that day. Like the day he got traded, we had to start figuring out ways to not for, make you forget about Eric Carlson, but just like, Hey, here, look at the return. Let's start building. Like, this is what we got. Like, these right. are the guys you're going to like some of these kids. And, and so it's, it's cool to see years later that like, yeah, universally uh, people were pretty, pretty excited about that today. Yeah. Yeah. And the trade, I mean, the trade worked out obviously for Ottawa. I, I, I mean, looking back, I think you got to give full marks to Pierre Dorian and for what he did. Cause right. They took a lot of heat and sometimes you just got to believe in what you're doing for yourself. Just like Trent Mann has said all along, like we, we believe what we're doing. And uh, that day they certainly believe that they were making the right call. So uh, for them, uh, full marks to Pierre Dorian for making that move. Um, all right. Time to move on, Craig. Let's get to some trivial trivia. Yeah, we got some Napoli stuff to give away today. Um, we were, we were going to do it on the live show, but honestly, that live show, boys, that was a lot of fun. I hope you guys had fun with that, too. We didn't get to the trivia answer. We were too busy. Those picks were coming fast and furious. Uh, unfo- not like the day two, but uh, <laughs> yeah. those two hours just flew by. So this is something we said we were going to do on the uh, on the live show. But uh, kind of circling back on that, we, we had asked, and this is for a uh, $50 gift certificate to a Napoli's Cafe located in the heart of Stittsville. Uh, so they specialize in homemade pasta. Definitely check them out on... Uh, NapolesCafe.com, uh, $50 gift certificate on the line for the correct answer of what player did Ottawa select in the 1992 expansion draft that never played an NHL game? The answer was John Van Kessel. I, I didn't know that. No. Uh, and, but shout out to at Gabe LaFrance on Twitter. He did know that. Uh, so keep an eye on your DMs because we're going to reach out to you shortly and uh, hook you up with a $50 gift card to Napoli's Cafe. Nice. Yeah, we got another one. It's another kind of uh, drafty one as we wrap up our draft coverage. Um, it, so it's another fifty dollars gift card. Hey, you can use this thing on the patio too. So they had a, they got a sweet patio there. It books up quick. So if you're going to use it, call, make a reservation. Great spot. Um, and the question is, how many top ten picks have the Ottawa Senators had? So if you know the answer to that, head on over to Twitter. Use the hashtag Wally Mathot. Be sure to tag at Napoli's Cafe underscore. Uh, and yeah, we'll announce the winner on our next show. Sounds good. Also, uh, go to gongshow.com if you want to order some Wally Mathot merchandise. The hats are up now, uh, sweatshirts, hoodies, and, of course, T-shirts. So um, if you like the content, especially what Meth has to say, because he's always got lots to say, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We will see you next time. Uh, thanks to Darren Dreger for joining us. And that is the Wally Mathot Show. Craig, uh, we'll see you again soon as well. Uh, time yeah. for us to drive on out of here.